So, good evening. Welcome to the Longmont Library. Um, tonight is our presentation of Spring Hikes with local author and Longmont resident, Pete KJ. So he's one of us, and he's come to talk to us about not just hiking, but hiking in our own backyard. And we'd like to let you know and thank the friends of the Longmont Library for um, supporting us and making these programs possible. We really do appreciate them and definitely want to make sure that you know they do so much good for us. So, without further ado, here is KJ. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. I hope you can hear me. I have a mic, right? Okay. Good. So, I am Pete KJ. I am an author and a hiker. Um, most recently, I authored a book on um, day hiking around here called Beast Camp Denver. 101 hikes in Colorado's front range. Um, but tonight is not about the book specifically. Mostly it's about hiking and specifically about hiking in the springtime. Um, like our host mentioned, I am a Longmont resident. So I'm a slightly biased. I think Longmont might be one of the most fantastic places to live in terms of hiking. And we're going to look at some great hikes to do nearby. But as, as you probably know, if you live in Longmont, we do live in a fantastic base camp for day hikers. You can get to the top of a mountain, watch the sunrise, and still you know, go out to breakfast and make it to work in the morning. You can, uh, if you want to. You can drive just a few dozen miles and get into some really remote wilderness, especially here in Longmont, with Rocky Mountain National Park and the Indian Peaks and all that, and all these canyons. And um, then you can come back and um, dine well catch a movie or a show, sleep in a bed. So it's just an incredible base camp. What you might be not be as aware of, and I, truthfully I wasn't even though I lived here for a long time before I researched this book, was that this is a place for a year round hiking. Um, it's easy to uh, perhaps mistakenly think, well it's winter time so I think I'll go skiing, I won't go hiking, you know, but we have so many trails that are available to us all year round. And I'm gonna work up, I'm gonna talk specifically to spring season uh, this evening. But first, I'd like to go over just a few basics. Um, the trails that we have available to us are for everybody. Uh, anyone who can walk can enjoy the trails. No experience is necessary, although you do get plenty of experience quickly as you, you know, as you go hiking. Um, you don't need, especially for day hiking, you don't need a lot of fancy equipment. Mostly you need uh, two legs and some decent shoes, but you can start out with okay shoes and develop your legs, see how that goes. <laughs> you also don't need money. Um, most of the places there's um, no parking fee. If there is a parking fee, it might be seven dollars. The, the exception, of course, is Rocky Mountain National Park, but there's ways, of, you know, to get good deals there. And so the cost that you have for experiencing the priceless experience of being with Mother Nature is usually just a few gallons of gas. So not only is it an inexpensive habit, it's also um, addictive, and it has this side effect that it's incredibly good for you. Um, <laughs> The more you go, the more you want to go, and the more your body loves it. At least that's what I've found. And so my recommendation is where to keep your hiking boots. Keep them in the boot, the trunk of your car. That's the best place for them, I think, if you live in Long <laughs> Um Briefly, let's talk about the front range itself. When I talk about the front range, I like to say welcome to the wall. I think this is a product of living in Lamont in particular because I think here the front range doesn't get any fronter. We have the, you know, that wall of the Indian Peaks, the 13ers, and then of course the 14 or Blanc's Peak that stares down at us every day. But it's interesting that um, those mountains, to imagine that those mountains were not the first mountains that were there. They're just the most recent mountains. There was an earlier range that started about 30 miles farther west that completely eroded down almost to nothing. And then it was about 60 million years ago um, when a no more recent uplift occurred when some continental plates collided a few thousand miles to the west to form what we have now. And it wasn't only until about a, recently, about a million years ago, that um, <laughs> things started to calm down to the state that they are now. And of course, erosion and uh, everything, and ice ages came and went and did their sculpturing magic. And towards the end of that most recent frozen period, about 11,000 years ago, that's when human beings had taken residence here. And then, as you know, much later, um, some European humans came, 1859, and found gold, which of course changed everything, and thousands and thousands of people moved here, and now, since 1876, Colorado has been the United States. So anyway, uh, the Front Range, for the purposes of tonight's discussion, is a swath of the Rocky Mountains, about 50 miles wide, about 150 miles long, 
from the Wyoming border with the Colorado, excuse me, Continental Divide serving as backbone. The divide starts to swoop to the west as we get down to about the, you know, the I-70 corridor, even with Denver. What you see here um, just happens to be these little hiker dudes with the triangles. Those are the um, 101 hikes that I decided had to be in a book on day hiking uh, from Denver. So as you can see in Longmont here, we are basically in the epicenter <laughs> of amazing hiking. And again, what I want to stress is that this is year-round hiking. The, the black triangles are um, all year long anytime. The blue ones are really good in winter. And then there's um, spring and fall ones in yellow. And then, of course, we get into the summer ones up higher. But so um, I just, um, as I was doing my research, uh, 31 of the hikes are for all year round. And then there's another 19 that are especially good right now in the spring and then of course also in the fall so that's like half of the heights um, that can be enjoyed right now weather permitting <laughs> <laughs> i do want to touch really quickly on like i said we don't need a lot of special clothes or equipment uh, you need basically your legs and if you do more than a tiny amount of hiking it's such a good idea to invest in some good quality lightweight hiking boots they're so affordable now they're so um much better than the clunkers that I hiked on when I was 10 that were made out of leather and had soles that weighed five pounds. <laughs> you can get these lightweight um, synthetic hiking boots with water resistant materials. Good idea to invest in those. The other things you need for day hiking, and we're speaking day hiking, keeping it simple. Um, water, extra clothes, and a pack to carry them in. Water, of course, since we're just out there for the day, you can bring tap water from your sink. You don't have to worry about the filter or purification tablets, although you can do that if you want. But two liters of water from your sink should get you through most of the day hikes. Also, especially now in the spring, but any time of the year, extra clothes are so important because as you know, the temperatures can swing um, a couple degrees, excuse me, a couple dozen degrees during the course of the day. So please don't ever go up very high or even not so high without extra clothes, i.e. Um, long pants, a hat, gloves, couple extra layers, sweater, and a wind and water shell. And if it's a beautiful day all day long and you never take those clothes out of your pack, that's great. Because you're going to so be so much better shape carrying around all that extra weight, right? <laughs> but it's just nice to have it there. I was born and grew up uh, hiking in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle. So I always bring lots of extra clothes because the assumption was you're going to hike in the rain. And I ended up always giving clothes to other people I'm with because other people tend not to bring them out. So, but one thing that is not wonderful here is that unlike where I grew up, the default is you'll probably be hiking in the sunshine. But you do want to be prepared. Another thing I like to bring is a small collapsible umbrella because it fits so well into the pack. Um, this is like a, a lady's umbrella I bought in Hanoi, Vietnam for three bucks and it just keeps on going and going. It packs up really small. Um, trekking poles, that's a personal preference. Lots of people swear by them, protecting the knees, uh, especially on the downhill. Also, a lot of people appreciate the upper body workout that you can get with those. So I recommend do definitely trekking poles if that's for you. I haven't started using them yet. I'm going to be 55 next month. So far, the knees are holding up, and I'm just keeping it simple. But I have a feeling trekking poles are in my future. Um, <laughs> getting these talks, a lot of people told me they like to use one. They like to bring one trekking pole. Um, you, you like to do that, mm -hmm. yeah? The stability that it adds to have three points of contact and just helping you get downhill and around things is a really good, good thing to have. Other things to bring along, um, other than what I mentioned, definitely put some sunscreen in your pack, um, insect repellent, a first aid kit is a must. Um, you might want to go with a map, topographical map. I won't get into that tonight, but those are nice to have if you do more than a little bit of hiking. Of course, bring your cell phone, number one, because that's probably how you're going to take pictures. And um, also, you more than likely will have reception a lot there, so it's a good way to be able to communicate if you need to. Um, I also make sure I have a flashlight for the reason that you might be having so much fun out there, you want to stay out late, and it takes the pressure off um, knowing that you can trek that last mile to the car, even if it's getting to be dusky, approaching dark. Um, anybody else have suggestions for things to put in your pack that are good? I have a question. Yes. Um, I'm new to Colorado, and the first hike I took was Left Hand Canyon, and there were signs posted for um, mountain lions. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. has been something that I've, I've just been here since October, so I'm like, I was alone, and I, I hope you're talking about that, but 
safety? Yes, um, a, I wasn't planning to talk so much about wildlife <laughs> safety tonight, but we can touch on that now. Just for one second. Just for one second. Mm -hmm. um, so mountain lions, um, it's quite rare to see them, but it's quite possible <coughs> that they see you without you seeing them. They avoid human beings when they can. Um, encounters are rare and attacks are far rarer, but they do occur. And with any wildlife encounter, there are a few things to remember. The most important thing is to stay calm and assume a dominant posture and a confident demeanor if you're in an encounter with any wildlife. With mountain lions, what you want to do is assume that posture, maybe make yourself look even bigger, perhaps by raising your jacket over your head, and back away slowly while speaking in a loud, calm voice, maintaining indirect eye contact. But keep in mind, this is extremely rare. I have yet to see a mountain lion. Um, when I do a mountain lion, lion talk, as part of my talk, I can only show a footprint in the snow because that's the closest I've come. But they are out there. And it, there are other things to remember. It's very important not to let children wander off by themselves, small children, and control your pet. And then, um, if you are in an interaction with a mountain lion, it's very important not to run because that can trigger their predatory response. And I, I'm sure a bunch of you probably heard about what happened at Horse Tooth Mountain about two months ago. Yeah. Trail runner, so of course he was running, and um, got attacked. Um, similar environment to Left Hand Canyon, foothills, wintertime. And um, this was actually a, a juvenile mountain lion, a kitten. It had lost its mother and it was starving, so it obviously hadn't been trained enough by its mother. It attacked something that was bigger than itself. And then the trail runner did exactly what you're supposed to do if you get attacked, which is to fight back. Yeah, because mountain lions are not used to having anything fight back. And they usually only make one or two sorties. And if you fight back, chances are you can fend them off. But you should never run and also never play dead. Just fight back. So, does that answer your concern? Yes. Are you going to um, yeah. still want to go hiking? <laughs> <laughs> I, have ne I have never seen one. Yes? Uh, what about like the little bells and stuff to hang on your back backpack? Yes, uh, bear bells. So I, I know some people do that or they play a radio. I like the sounds when I'm hiking, so I, didn't do, I don't do that. And like, seeing a bear is almost as rare as seeing a mountain lion. So, but that is definitely a possibility. Um, some people recommend bringing the whistle. Having a whistle handy because they can make a lot of noise. It's they don't weigh anything. Also, to, if you need help, you can signal your location with a whistle. So, somebody else had a question? Yes. I wonder whether or not you what you think about matches or compass or survivor blanket or extra food. Or right. So I'm thinking those things are more for um, overnight trips. But yes, you want to bring extra clothes, perhaps that. Um, that blanket to provide extra warmth. Definitely have some food in your backpack. Um, a compass. Um, yes, map and compass are are useful. It depends on what hike you're choosing. A lot of day hikes, the trail is very well defined. You know, if you know what you're doing, you have enough um, information. But definitely a good idea to have along. I find in Colorado, it's not too hard to f figure out which direction is which. <laughs> the orientation of the mountains. Quite often it's clear, you can see the position of the sunshine, but still that's probably a good idea. Any others? You ready to go hiking? Okay. Let's go do some virtual hiking. Okay, so we're talking about spring time now. And hiking around here is simple, you know, when it's hot, go high, when it's cold, stay low. That means spring can get a little complicated because it's it's not hot and it's not cold, so you want, don't go higher or low, you go in between. And furthermore, as you have seen, and as we're probably going to continue to see, we get to this stage of the year and the weather just goes into this holding pattern, where the snow has retreated to a certain level and it's just kind of oscillating at about nine, ten thousand 10,000 feet, and then it snows and it's white all the way down into Longmont. And then, so it's, it's a tricky season, and I think practice, experience uh, helps on knowing where to go. But I'm going to talk about some hikes that are really good short list, you know, for spring when you're trying to figure out where to go. The first one is kind of the oddball of the 101 that I chose, and I think it's a must. It's called Pawnee Buttes, 
And to get to it, it's about, it's about an hour and 45 minutes from here, two, about two hours. You want to go up and head east on 14 from Fort Collins. And um, what you get in the Pawnee Buttes is some beautiful um, windswept um, solitude, uh, prairie views that stretch off to infinity. It's an easy hike, um, about four and a half miles round trip, where you can see these two interesting looking buttes and really kind of experience some prairie wilderness. And also, um, in the spring, right now and in the next couple weeks, the uh, springtime wildflowers are going to start getting really, really good out there. And getting to Pawnee Views is kind of half the fun. <laughs> it's just so out there. Um, if you Google it, um, Google's going to send you off on all these um, wind farm and oil rig service roads through towns that don't really exist called Kyoto, which is, I couldn't even find Kyoto. I saw a house, and that was Kyoto. The best thing to do is uh, set your GPS or whatever on Grover. And then from Grover, it's 25 easy mile minutes to get to Pawnee Buttes. And Grover is kind of an interesting town anyway. I have to warn you, um, I'm, at heart, I'm a novelist and a travel writer, so I love to tell stories. And I love the stories that go in with each hike. So I'm going to start to interject the stories here. But Grover was an original per, um, pioneer town that was plotted in 1889 as a stop on along the railroad that went to and from Cheyenne, Wyoming. And as of 2010, it had 137 people in its census. And so there's still a few buildings there. There's like the old depot there. And then there's like the only business is like this combination uh, grocery store, bar, grill, and laundromat. And it's just kind of fun to pop in there and get a cup of coffee or a snack before heading off to the views. And also, um, it has some literary notoriety because um, Willa Cather wrote a short story called The Affair at Grover Junction in 1900. You can read it for free online at Willa Cather's Institute page. It's this really kind of spooky ghost story murder mystery that puts you right back in the times. And it's kind of interesting to read that story and then go to Grover and go to the Buttes. Anyway, from, uh, from Grover, it's 25 easy minutes to the Buttes. Uh, you can't miss them when you're driving up to them. They look like these two startling box-like birthday presents, you know, just kind of sticking out of the prairie. But this is just going to be deceiving in the prairie. This photo is taken from the parking lot. It looks like you can probably walk there in a few minutes, but it's actually a couple of miles away. And you don't really start out by walking towards them. You actually walk towards some beautiful whitish cliffs to the left, which are called the Overlook. And along the way, you're going to get lots of, right now, spring wildflowers, a lot of bird song, because this is a major bird flyaway. You might not see the birds up close, but you'll definitely hear them. And you come down through this beautiful valley with junipers and flowers, and the whitish cliffs are not in the picture. And you wind your way through the valley, and you get back up onto the prairie, and the first view <laughs> looks no closer than it did when you left the car. It feels like you're in some kind of optical illusion land. But you just keep on trudging, and the, the prairie is really beautiful. It's mostly a short grass prairie, blue grandma, and what's the other one? I don't know but these are hardy grasses that form a really tough sod against the wind. And it took settlers several generations in a dust bowl to realize that you shouldn't be plowing this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> the Pawnee Views National Grassland is pretty much an area that got plowed and dug up and destroyed, but now it has been restored. And it's one of the reasons why it's one of our national grasslands. You keep on trudging though, and you arrive beneath the first view. And it's just kind of surprising. You know, it's like, what is this? A hunk of a comet? <laughs> you know, a corroded alien spaceship. Yeah. But um, it turns out that it's very much of the Earth. It's just simply part of the ancient high, high plains that didn't erode down into the South Platte River. So it's protected by these, uh, a layer of um, conglomerate and sandstone. And then there's this really soft in interior called clayish white called the Brule Formation, which um, if you want to describe it um, uh, geologically, is white to pale, blocky to facious clay stone, and lenticular acrosic conglomerate, oh, which is about 40 million years old. <laughs> and it forms these basically 30 to 50 foot cliffs that ring the butte. So if you want to, if you want to think about climbing the butte, I would encourage you to stop thinking about it because I circle, I like to do the top of things, and I look, I circled each of the buttes, and it's not a good idea to try to climb these things. So. After enjoying the first view, you can continue on a trail that slants down to the equally enjoyable to look at second view. And when you get there, if you want to get adventurous, you can admire it from the base and then turn back. If you want to get adventurous, there is a trail of sorts that goes around the base, kind of a um, social trail, I guess we'll call it. But I would recommend it, because you get over to the other side, 
And then you just get this eastern view stretching off to infinity through the clay bear. It's just really lovely. Another good thing about the Pawnee Buttes is um, it's good to go there late in the afternoon because then you can watch the sun slanting and the light changing on the buttes. And it's an excellent place for stargaze. You can do a little hike in the afternoon, get back to the car. Um, very little light contamination because you can't see the glow of Fort Collins from there. Denver is not detectable from there. Grover, the metropolis of Grover, at population 137, isn't going <laughs> to do anything. You know? There are some like red flickering lights from the wind farms on the horizon, but once that sky opens up and the Milky Way and all that, it just takes over. So, that's Pawnee Buttes. Let's move on to another one. Another great hike for spring. Uh, if you want to in the mood for like a deep forest walk yeah. alongside powerful rushing water, goes along Colorado's only wild and scenic river. I would recommend uh, Big South. It takes you through rock gorges and waterfalls, and like I said, very remote wooded hillsides. Um, this hike, you can go for it as long as you want because it continues all the way into Rocky Mountain National Park. But I recommend doing a 3.75 mile out and back to, for a seven and a half miles round trip to get into the heart of the forest. And it doesn't have a lot of elevation here, only 700 feet. It follows a portion of the Cachalapuru River. Here the river is flowing from north to south. It's draining the backside of the Mummy Range before it takes a big swoop to the east. Hence, that's why it's called Big South. But it starts off in a beautiful forest where you can't see the river, you can only hear it. And then soon enough, you just within the first half mile, you come to a beautiful gorge where there's uh, waterfalls and steep hillsides opposite. Like I said, this is uh, Colorado's only wild and scenic river. Uh, that was declared by the 1968 Wild and Scenic River Act, which means that the flow can't be altered or dammed or otherwise you know, messed with. Uh, from this point up to the headwaters in Rocky Mountain National Park, the river is classified as wild. And then from this point down, it's classified as scenic. But it doesn't really change what it is. It's protected for a quarter mile on each side. Um, and it's embedded in Comanche Peak Wilderness, so it's pretty well protected anyway. So it's a really, really nice um, deep forest feel. And it's basically kind of a mesmerizing meander along the river. You'll be walking along the river and then met right next to the river and then that's, the hillside will get steeper so you've got to walk upside the hill over the top into some more woods and then back down to the river. So you just kind of get into this pattern. And in about 3.75 miles you arrive at, actually after just about two miles you'll arrive at this beautiful section with a lot of waterfalls and um, Nice stone trail that follows alongside the <laughs> Like I said, you can keep on going and going and going, but about 3.75 miles is a very nice place to turn around in the woods alongside the river. Um, like I said, it's a good one to go in spring, perhaps later spring, depending on what kind of snowfall. I went just a couple weeks ago, and I was surprised. There was still a lot of snow on the trail, but it was still a very delightful hike. It was a different kind of hike because that's neither, by the way. Yeah. It, it wasn't rushing water. I, I was walking on mostly snowpack on the trail without, it hadn't melted, so I wasn't falling through too much. And the river was still covered over, so it was, the sound was reduced to a trickle. And it was really beautiful. And you could see different shapes in the snow on the river. For example, I don't know if you see what I see here. It's like getting a Valentine in April. Oh. That was kind of nice. <laughs> so, like I said, I love stories. So, are you guys familiar with the story of how it became named the Kashlapudra River? I'll, go, I'll tell it really quick. So, legend has it it was either the 1920s or the 1930s, so long before settlement, where there was a group of French um, trappers. They were camping along the, this river, probably close to the present day settlement of Laporte or Bellevue or something like that. And they got caught in a snowstorm and they were carrying all their stuff in wagons. And so the snow got so deep that they couldn't roll their wagons through the snow. And so what they decided to do was to lighten their loads. And they dug a pit uh, near the river and they buried a lot of their things, their belongings, intending to come back later and pick it up. They also buried a lot of their powder, their gunpowder. So it's cash, they cached La Poudre next to the river. And then they covered it with soil, and they burned brush on top of it to make it look like a campfire, so that Native Americans wouldn't 
come and find their things. So all I know is if I was in that party, I would have been very far away from the fire. <laughs> 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 So. All right, let's move on to another hike. Let's go to one that's in, close to Rocky Mountain National Park. Actually, it's in the Rocky Na National Park. Yes, question. Yeah, I have a question about um, hiking on the snow. Did you wear um, cleats or anything in the snow? A lot of people use yak tracks. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing, and definitely bring poles to walk with. Um, I didn't focus on snow hiking. My book is all about hiking on dry trail. So that's yeah, just the other week you were at this trail. Yeah, that snow, snow, that snow day was kind of an exception for me because because like I say, there's so much trails available all year round that you don't have to walk on the snow. That is kind of a separate type of hiking that I think is its own discipline. You know, so. All right, so Dunn Lake is actually in Rocky Mountain National Park. It's, it's from a trailhead where you don't have to pay the entrance fee to Rocky Mountain National Park. It's basically just in the outskirts of Estes, the town of Estes Park, called the Lumpy Ridge Trailhead. And you get really, really nice rock formations. It's a fairly short trail, but it's also a fairly steep trail. So in the three and a half miles round trip, you're going to gain 1,000 feet. And um, like I said, you start out just at the Lumpy Ridge Trailhead and just head up to little tiny Gem Lake couched in the rocks. When you arrive at Lumpy Ridge Trailhead, you don't have to, not too many people question why is this called Lumpy Ridge, it's pretty <laughs> obvious. This is just a specimen, but the whole place is filled with these weird spires and domes and rock formations. And what this is, it's, it's a big hunk of granite that's 1.5 billion years old or so, and um, it didn't ever get glaci glacierized, glaciated. It, what happened is it got covered with several thousand layers of sediment. And so what that did is it put a lot of pressure on the granite. So the granite sat pressurized under the sediment for eons. And then the sediment eroded away and relieved the pressure on the granite. So the granite relaxed to the side that wasn't under pressure. And the outer ring, outer parts of it cracked into layers, un, not so unlike you know, layers of an onion. And then freeze and thaw action came and went, and plant and, and uh, other action came. and so. These outer layers exfoliated, that's what the term is. It fell off, and then you, wind and water came and just sculpted into the, these odd rock formations. Yes? Is, is Gem Lake a little bit above Bear Lake? It's yeah. in a different part of the park. Oh, you get to so Bear Lake, you want to drive pretty deep I, into the I park. I think of Emerald Lake. Park. Right, that's, a, that's what you're thinking of, close to Bear Lake. Yeah. <laughs> so you get to enjoy these rock formations all the way to Gem Lake. And also, like I said, it's a steep hike. And so not only are you getting to enjoy the rock formations near you, but you get to turn around and get a beautiful view of um, the valley, Meeker, Long's Peak, and the whole continental divide that goes through Rocky Mountain National Park, which I think is especially beautiful and it's still caked in snow. And this is one of those hikes where you can be walking on dry trail, but getting really close to those mountains that are still caked in white. As you switch back up, you encounter some strange rock formations. For example, this one. Well, first you get a mushroom formation. That's pretty interesting. And then there's this one, which has been given the nickname uh, Paul Bunyan's boot. <laughs> you can see a boot in that formation, but I think that Paul Bunyan needs some boot repair. <laughs> but as you continue, you know you're getting close to the lake when the trail starts going alongside this wall. It looks like it's, it feels like it's just oozing down on you. And then as you get up to the notch, there's like pancake formations. And right after that, you arrive at Gem Lake. Now, lake might be a little bit of an overstatement. I, guess. <laughs> I don't want to call it gem pond or puddle. Actually, that's what it is. It's a puddle. It's what's called a pothole pond. So it doesn't get fed by any stream. It just gets filled up with snow melt and rainwater. And so it's going to stay wet as long as we get thunderstorms in the summer. But if you're there in the spring, it's definitely going to be full with you know the melting snow from the hillsides around. And um, then it just fills up and spills over. And if you like to scramble around on rocks, of course, it's kind of irresistible. When you get here, you usually see people who are doing just that. <laughs> um, it's OK. It's allowed. Be careful, of course. You don't probably want to go up this way. It's fun to go around back, and there's easier ways to get up there and have a catbird seat over Gem Lake. But if rock scrambling is not your cup of tea, this lake comes with its own beach. <laughs> so beach. 
You can recline on the beach and watch other people scramble around. And then there's an added bonus. On the way back down, when you get close to the trailhead, you can take a right on, uh, I think it's Black Canyon Trail, and make a short little loop to go to another rock formation. It's quite famous, called the Twin Owls. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you can see two birds with puffed out chests in there. Yeah. The Twin Owls are very uh, popular among rock climbers. However, uh, rock climbing is forbidden there, I think it's from March through July, because that's where uh, raptors, you know, eagles and falcons do their nesting, so they don't allow rock climbing for that period of the year. But, so if you go in the springtime, you won't see rock climbing. Mm -hmm. All right, feel free to break in with questions or comments if you've done any of these hikes, particularly enjoyed them, or have something to add, I'm happy to include you in the talk. Here's another one that's really good for spring, good for everyone, the whole family, young and old, uh, right outside of Rocky Mountain National Park. This is Lily Mountain. Um, it packs a thrilling punch, and it's accessible in the spring. Um, it's four miles round trip. It's a thousand feet elevation gain. However, <laughs> all of that thousand feet is in the second half because you start off just traversing on the hillside before it gets serious. So it's also a good. It's a decent workout, um, but as you can see, um, my children are doing it with me here. It's a really good one for everybody, and especially in the spring to get your mountain lungs and legs going. So, like I said, it starts off on a fairly dry hillside traverse. Um, CO, what is it, CO7? Yeah, which is also known as the Peak to Peak Highway, which is Colorado's oldest scenic byway. That's where you park, and the highway kind of parallels you for a little while, but it drops away quickly, and you don't hear it for very long. And you walk for the first uh, three quarters of a mile, no, first half of a mile, and actually you're 50 feet lower after the first half of a mile. And you're wondering, I thought I was climbing a mountain. But never fear, eventually the trail turns upward, does a few switchbacks, and you do come to a nice little rock overlook that has a really good view of Estes Park uh, Valley in the town. And here's where the switchbacks start to get serious. Here the trail slants upward and it never relents. It doesn't look too serious here, but we're in the thick of the switchbacks now. Um, it's an excellent trail, a lot of wood reinforced steps. It alternates between southern faced hillsides and then northern ones that are more dense, and then sheep clearings on the shoulder. And you know you're getting closer to the prize if you're tired and if it's starting to get rockier and rockier. So there is a little bit of rock scrambling towards the top which may or may not be your cup of tea, but it makes it fun. Uh, makes it a little bit different, especially for kids. And another good thing about this hike is that the mountain itself does a really good job of hiding the view <laughs> until you get to the very top, and it's like, boom, <laughs> wow. Um, it's one of those cases where a photo really can't do justice, because you've been hiking up through the woods for an hour or so, and then you get to the top, and it looks, mountains tend to look small and Photos with horizon, but when you're out there, they're just so big and so powerful. You see a uh, meek or a long speak and all the ones cutting through Rocky Mountain National Park, and you can just see how impressed my daughter is. <laughs> 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 yeah. A word on meek and longs, the twin peaks, we call them, right? When you're on top of them from Lily Mountain, you realize that they're not exactly twins. In fact, Meeker has its own twin summit, you know? So does Longs, if you count the beaver prong. Do you guys see a beaver shape here? Yeah. This is the long, long, long peak beaver prong, <laughs> and then Longs Peak. Meeker actually is only 300 feet shorter than Longs Peak. And thousands and thousands of people climb Longs Peak every summer, but almost no one ever does Meeker. So that's something to keep in mind. It's a very easy ascent up the ridge. But that's kind of an aside. So when you're looking at it from this, perspective, you see that what we call Long's Peak from Longmont here, we're looking at Meeker, really. It's just a little tiny bit of Long's Peak that's poking up. And the two peaks were named after two very, very different men. Um, Long's Peak, named after Stephen H. Long, who after Lewis and Clark, at the turn of the, of the 1800s, he was more active in the 1820s. He did far more than Lewis and Clark. He did several different expeditions, covered more than 26,000 miles on several expeditions, but he's not nearly as well known. And he didn't do it his whole career. He did it for like 10 years and then went back east and got into the railroad business. I guess money is important, you know? <laughs> so, and then there's Mount Meeker, which is named after a very different person, Nathan Meeker, uh, who was a novelist more in the 1860s, so later. Novelist and ardently religious man who uh, worked to establish a religious, religious 
the religious colony at what is now Greeley, um, as with the colony that Longmont originally started out as, those things tended only to work for about a year or two before they kind of reverted to being normal towns. So that's what happened to Meeker. After that, he got himself appointed Indian agent. So he was working with the Utes. Specifically, he was trying to convince the Utes to quit being shamanists and to quit being nomads, and instead to be Christians and to farm, which um, was kind of a leap for the Utes. And, um, so he was encouraging them to kill a bunch of their horses. You don't need all these horses, so kill your horses and plant crops. And they ended up killing him in what's known as the Meeker ma Massacre of uh, 1879, I think it was. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do another one. Oh, then you get the descent, too. Like I said, you get to scramble up and you get to scramble down. And that's why I noticed that my daughter decided to go hiking in her converse. I didn't expect her shoe to be probably left. <laughs> Converse is not the best one. <laughs> Here's one that's right in our backyard. Um, wonderful to hike right now. Uh, Saran St. Brain and Miller Rock. All you need to do is drive up Left Hand Canyon, hang a right, and go through Jamestown. And as you get close to the peak to peak highway, the trailhead will be on your right. So um, it's a six mile round trip, a thousand feet elevation gain. You start off going downhill, and then you go up. And of course, you reverse that. And it's really nice because it starts off hiking down along the south fork of the St. Brain Creek. So it's a little bit like the Big South Trail. You get a nice forest walk with rushing water before you turn uphill and get to Miller Rock. So right now, um, it might look like this with some snow patches. It starts off on a beautiful trail that was built in the 1970s by the Youth Conservation Corps, which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. It was modeled on the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Depression Area Program that built a lot of trails. Um, and it traverses a steep hillside with the stream rushing by below you. You might have to walk across some snow patches, so yeah, I might want to bring your pole, your trekking pole to this one if you're doing it right now. But that's only for the next couple of weeks. And that, the steep hillside only lasts a little while, then you descend into the valley and hike right alongside the river where the water is beautiful and there's squirrels and birds and the rushing water. It's really nice. And then you uh, head up a steeper and drier hillside to come and meet with a four-wheel drive road, which you turn right on the four-wheel drive road, and you don't have to wonder where Miller Rock is for very long, because it starts to peek at you through the trees. So the story here is that there was a guy named Miller, and apparently he stole somebody's horse or something, and there was a lynch mob coming after him. And he came up here and hid on Miller Rock to avoid that case. So there's a little fire ring, campfire ring, by the base of Miller Rock here. And if you want to climb Miller Rock, you can shimmy right up a class four chimney and get there. Right? Does everybody want to do that? <laughs> if you don't like rock climbing, you can go around to the north side. And everybody can do this. Two, year, two or three-year-olds can do this. You can climb up a uh, vegetated, uh, more gentler route on the north side of the rock. And again, you get there, and it's one of those situations where the photograph can't do it justice, especially right now in the spring, because you're just at the edge of all the other mountains that are caked in the snow. So it's a 360-degree view of the prairies and then the whole swath of the front range that is still caked in snow. So it's curious why the creek is called St. Brain and why the trail is called Saran St. Brain. Um, so quickly, what the deal is with that is Saran St. Brain was a uh, French trader. He was born into a wealthy family in St. Louis in 1802, and he went west and helped the Benton brothers establish a lot of trading posts. And one of the posts they established was called Fort St. Brain, which is um, right where this creek, St. Brain Creek, which comes through our town here, uh, merges with the South Platte River out by Platteville, east of Longmont. And so that's where they built uh, Fort St. Brain. So if you ever want to have a little oddball excursion, because this too is in our backyard, you can drive to Platteville. And just north of Platteville, you head west on Colorado Road 40, and you think you're lost. The road is dirt, and you think you're going nowhere. <laughs> then the road ends at this memorial, which itself is historical, because it was put there in 1911 by the Daughters of the American Revolution. Okay. They did some archaeology and just said, yes, yeah, this is where Fort St. Brain was. And they put this marker, which is now more than 100 years old itself. So it's just kind of a funky, interesting, oddball thing to do an afternoon in Mon And you get a nice, beautiful view of the confluence of the river. You also get a view of 
the modern Fort St. Vrain, <coughs> which is the energy stations that they like to hide out in the plains where nobody can really see them. This one in particular is natural gas fired, but it started this life as a nuclear power plant. Colorado's only nuclear power plant before it got uh, converted to natural gas back in the 1970s. A little bit of the story. I kind of get off topic sometimes <laughs> with the stories. Yes? So I've heard the name pronounced Saran St. Brain and Saran St. Brain. Are you a definitive? Yep, I, I bet Saran is probably right. I have no idea. Being a writer, I don't know, Susan, do you ever like say words to yourself in your head and Realize that you're the only one who's pronouncing the word this way, but because you've said it to yourself so many times, you think it's correct. Yeah. <laughs> Saren, Saren makes sense. I don't know. I hoped you would just be like, "Oh no, it's Saran." I I know for a fact. <laughs> Look that up. Another great one, very close to us, Rattlesnake Gulch. Absolutely had to put Rattlesnake Gulch in the book because it's in El Dorado Canyon. If you've never been to El Dorado Canyon State Park, you can go there all year round. So it's good in the winter. Um, also in the spring. This is a nice four mile hike. It's uh, mostly a loop. You gain a thousand feet during it and start off right in the heart of the canyon, traverse up the hillside, then do a loop. It has some interesting features. You come to some hotel ruins, which I'm going to talk about. A really nice viewpoint and some train tracks. And of course, the rock formations themselves, which are amazing right from the car. You get out of the car and you see that west wall of El Dorado Canyon, which has been a rock climber's mecca ever since the beginning of rock climbing. And it still is. I mean, if you go there, you will see people climbing those rocks. So you, you, hit, you start out walking just alongside them, gazing up at them, and you see a slot of the prairie through the valley. And then this formation called the Bastille, which is also interesting, and I want to talk about that more in a second. Then you head up a uh, very excellent trail, switchbacking up, and soon come to a plateau on the hillside where you find a fireplace and some bits of foundation and a circular cement, um, poured cement thing, which was the water fountain at the entrance of what was called the Crags Hotel, which was a luxury hotel that was um, built up there in 1908, and it lasted uh, five seasons before it, uh, the hotel burned under mysterious circumstances. And um, in this era, the turn of the 1900s, of course, we didn't have El Dorado State Park. El Dorado Canyon was like a, a, a splashy resort with a carnival-like atmosphere and nice hotels down at the bottom of the canyon. Of course, we had the artesian water, which filled the swimming pools. And people came there for these healing powers and all that. And on any given summer day, there'd be 10, I mean, any given summer, 10 to 15,000 people would visit El Dorado for that. And luminaries too, like Dwight and Amy Eisenhower honeymoon there. Glenn Miller came and played the ballroom. Um, so that was at the main place down in the valley. And this hotel was built up on a hillside. And people would get there either by wagon, which is now the trail we're walking on, or there was a funicular that went up and down the hill, powered by gravity. I think they used either water or logs or something to offload the weight. Or they came by train from Denver. Like I said, there's train tracks nearby, Dubai. And then they could just walk a short distance or take burrows down to the Craig's Hotel. Hmm. Then you pass the hotel and you start on the loop trip. And then you come to what I think is the best part of the hike, which is a viewpoint of the Indian Peaks. Again, really, really nice in the late winter, early spring when they're still coated in white. You get uh, south of Arapaho all the way to Shoshone. And you can, it's a nice place to stop, eat, have lunch, you know, have some water. And then you continue walking a little traversing, and you end up very close to this red scar in the hillside where these train tracks cut through. This is where the visitors who are coming to the Craig's Hotel could get off at a stop called Scenic Siding. But the train tracks are still very much in operation. This is um, you know, uh, Union Pacific and Amtrak, the California the Zephyr, California Zephyr pass between Chicago and San Francisco passes each way once once a day. So if you do this like you'll probably hear and or see the train. Of course people don't get off anymore. However, this is likely uh, where in 1913 an arsonist got off and uh, walked to the Craig's Hotel because the hotel burned in October. Now as you know, we don't often get lightning storms in October. And it was reported that some suspicious people got off the train that day and walked down into the canyon, and that was the day that the hotel burned. <laughs> Interesting feature when you get down into the canyon again, like I said, you can walk, you can turn right on the, on the main trail and uh, walk towards this 
feature called the Bastille, and there's switchbacks that go down next to the Bastille where you meet the road close to where your car is parked. And it's interesting to look up at that log formation and imagine a tightrope strung 600 feet above you, and imagine a man named Ivy Baldwin tightrope walking over it dozens and dozens of times over decades. Sometimes having to walking backwards, sometimes having to stop and hang by his legs for an hour and wait for a storm to go by. <laughs> <laughs> Ivy Baldwin was born in 1866 in Houston, and he ran away from home at the age of 10 to San Antonio to become a paper boy. And um, there, he got, I know, <laughs> he got really good at walking across the San Antonio River. There was a cable strung. And shortly after that, at age 11, he ran away with the circus, but he'd already run away, so I guess he joined the circus. And he started doing trapeze with a couple of guys named Baldwin, so he became one of the Baldwin brothers. He just honed his skills. And in those days, um, late 18, later 1800s, uh, balloon stunts were getting really popular. We didn't have any aviation to speak of yet, but balloons were becoming big. And in those days, balloons were basically bed sheets that were sewn together, and a group of men would hold it, hold it down over an open fire, and the hot air would fill up the balloon. And people would gather to watch it go up in the air to about 3,000 feet and cool and slowly um, descend. And so one day, one of the balloon riggers got drunk, and <laughs> Ivy Baldwin. Um, he was perfect to fill in because he is five foot three, 120 pounds. So as the balloon goes up, what happens is one of the crew gets caught in the rigging. And so Ivy would get caught in the rigging and go up with the balloon and perform stunts as it's going up in the air and the crowd is gasping. Then he get to about 2,500 feet and he let go and fall and pull a parachute out of the backpack and ride down. <laughs> so this guy liked to be up in the air. <laughs> and he never lost um, his love of trape uh, excuse me, um, tightrope walking though. So he started working in El Dorado um, right when El Dorado was at its peak in 1906, 1908. And he was like a Denver institution, very famous personality in and around Denver. And he continued to do it all through his life. And in fact, he did his last walk um, in, let's see, at age, on his 82nd birthday, <laughs> that's when he did it. His last time was lost, although his daughter, his daughter forced him to sit the table a little bit lower for that one. <laughs> you can Google this, and Life Magazine did a spread on that. In fact, there's even a video of him doing the walk. It's really, really interesting. He used to say that his, um, he had the most dangerous, his, his job was like the most dangerous poison in the world, because one drop will kill you. <laughs> yes. Do you know if he ever reconnected with his parents? I don't know. I didn't find that in my Google. Yeah. What was the question? Did he ever reconnected with his parents? Yeah. But he was born in 1866, and he died. He didn't get killed on any of his exploits. He died in bed in El Dorado Springs at the age of 87. So despite leaving the, leaving this crazy life, he vastly exceeded any life expectancy for anybody born in 1866. <laughs> I'm going to skip over this one because I, I don't want to use up all of our time. Um, I have a few more I'd like to talk about. But um, another good place to go in the spring is uh, Golden Gate State Park. There's a loop called the Black Bear Frazier Trail. It's um, five and a half miles round trip. Was well, a loop, thousand feet of gain. It's good in the fall, of course, too. A lot of the spring hikes are also excellent in the fall because it's at that elevation where the aspen are changing. That's a picture of the loop. So you head out of the Black Bear Trail. You get to a meadow with Aspen before you head down the valley. And it's an interesting place to walk with beautiful views. Um, there's the Fraser Meadow in the fall, excuse me, spring, there's it in the fall. Good place to go for a picnic. Um, interesting stories, too, with the Fraser, Fraser Barn and Fraser Meadow. Um, I'm going to move on to another one. I'm going to go a little farther away now. I'm going to close the night with doing two spring hikes that are a little bit farther afield that I think are worth the drive to get there. The first one is uh, Devil's Head. Um, it's a little bit of a drive to get there, and it's also 10 miles on a, quite a, a bumpy dirt road. You can do it in a normal car, but the last 10 miles is a bit of a bumpy ride. Um, the road, Rampart Range Road, opens usually around April 1st, so it just got opened. But it's a good idea to go now because um, on any given summer, um, tens of thousands of people visit Devil's Head. But they tend not. They tend to go in the summer. They tend not to go in the spring. If you go there on a summer afternoon, there's going to be a mob scene. But if you go on a, a morning in early May, you might be the only one there, like I was. 
So that's why I recommend it. It's an easy trail. It's only three miles round trip, and it's 900 feet elevation gain, but you get incredible views. So that's a picture of it in the summer or uh, fall. Here's a picture of the spring morning that I went. A little bit soft <laughs> Um, like I said, it's a pretty easy trail. It begins uh, among some really nice rock formations. Um, right after you start the trail, you come to this place where all the trees are wiped out, and you wonder what's going on here. This was an EF1 tornado that landed in 2015. Tornadoes are um, rated from EF1 to EF5, EF0 to EF5. EF0 means literal no damage. EF5 means train cars thrown a mile. So this was an EF1, and it just uprooted the trees. We continue on the trail. It's an excellent trail. It's actually better than the road you drove in on. <laughs> but it had to be because they were installing the, what I'm going to talk about in a minute, the fire brigade on top. So it had to accommodate mule train and a tractor and all that kind of thing. In fact, some portions are even paved, but not much of it. It's a very gentle trail. Switchbacks up. You head through a notch in the rocks, and you arrive at a beautiful little meadow at the top of the hill, which is called Devil's Half Acre. And inside this half acre is the coziest looking of cabins. And uh, that's actually where the fire lookout li lives during the fire watching season. But that's, of course, not the only thing to look at. You look up and you see the way <laughs> to, the, um, to the fire watch. It's a metal stairway. It uh, has 143 steps. I counted them. <laughs> and it's truly dizzying and fun. Um, another good reason to go in the spring is because only five people are allowed up there at a time. And if you're 15 or younger, you have to be accompanied by an adult, of course. So if you go during crowded periods, you have to wait in line to go up there. But I have never waited. I went in the spring and I went in the fall. And it's really, really fun. Um, the, the cabin was built in 1951. It's very rustic and cozy looking. It's got a lot of character. It's got a wood burning stove inside. Uh, instruments. The walls are covered with memorabilia, and um, you also get to meet these there. The fire watch. Um, this is I should have it memorized. This is Bill Ellis. He's in his 80s now, and he did. I think I'm not sure if he's still there. He might be in one of his last years. There. He's been doing this since the 1980s, living in this cabin from you know May through October. It's a lot of fun to talk to you. Walk into you into the cabin and wants to, and is happy to talk to you and take pictures and that kind of thing. Um, he even um, raised his two children here, living in the cabin, because they had to start living there in May while school was still in session. So his two kids had to walk down the trail every morning, catch the bus, and just sit out. <laughs> and he told me that um, it's you know it's he's still you know doing some good work because what was it in um, 2017 he, he spotted three fires. And in 2016, which was drier, he spotted seven fires. And the main feature here is the, um, the it's called an Olson, I got it on my list here, Olson Fire Finder. So what you do is you, and this is the original fire finder that came with the 1951 cabin. And you, you scan the horizon for smoke, and when you see it, you locate it with the fire site and then pinpoint it on the fire finder. So um, also another thing he has in there, the stool that he's sitting on has glass boots. So when a uh, lightning storm approaches, he lifts up his legs and sits on his glass booted stool and he can be safe. I'm sure he's had to do that quite a lot. So he's like one of the only, this lookout is one of the only ones left in Colorado on National Forest Land. And he's one of the only fire watches that's left. But, this one is kept into operation. I think it's a combination of sentimental value, as well as the fact that it just has a commanding view of a ton of forests. Um, but up until the 1980s, uh, excuse me, 70s, being a fire watch was a really important job. And in the decades preceding that, up to 8,000 people worked at that. And we had them all over the place where I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and they were all decommissioned around that time. Because of that, in the 1970s, it started to become cost effective to monitor by satellite and airplane and that kind of thing. But then again, uh, the, the lookout is one thing, but the view is actually the best thing about getting to the top of Devil's Head. Really interesting rock formations. You can see all the way to Pike's Peak, and then of course you can look west from there. Um, Devil's Head is called Devil's Head. You can't really see it from here, but if you look at the peak from below, a lot of people see a creature with horns gazing upward. 
And there's a lot of folklore associated with devils here, lots of stories, rumors that stolen gold is buried here, rumors that there's a lost topaz mine somewhere on the side of the mountain because um, orphan gems have been found over the decades. And over the decades that there were fire washes here, um, some of the fire washes swore that they saw the spirit of a miner searching for his lost mine. So their imagination can kind of go wild while you're up here. All right. We're getting close to the end of our talk. I want to take questions and all that, but I do want to go over one more hike that's excellent for spring. That's farther afield that you may or may not be familiar with. And this is Dome Rock. It's a state wildlife area. It's um, south of uh, Woodland Park and uh, the town of Divide. And um, it's a wonderful place to go. It's, um, it's not nearly as well known. You might have heard of Mueller State Park, which is adjacent and next door to Dome Rock. Mueller is a state park with an entrance fee and miles and miles of big manicured trails. Dome Rock is a state wildlife area that's primarily concerned with preserving bighorn sheep and they don't advertise it. Um, you need to know how to get there. Uh, it's, not, it's not a lot of big signs. It's just a dirt road, a very manageable dirt road, and a no fee parking lot to get there. But it's a beautiful walk. The walk I'm going to talk about real quick is actually kind of long. It's 11 miles. Um, it has a 1,400 feet of vertical gain. And it starts off along the creek and then goes up onto a hillside to an overlook. And the reason why you want to walk the whole 11 miles is because you want to see Dome Rock. And a few people see Dome Rock because they keep it very well hidden, very well embedded inside this wildlife area. You can walk to Dome Rock, and I'm going to talk about that later, but I don't recommend that in this hike for reasons that will become clear in a second. So you head out on the creek. It's a beautiful creek walk. You see the creek rushing through here. You get that trademark. South facing hillside, very dry and barren. North facing hillside, much more dense and moist and vegetated. The temperature between the two hillsides can vary by up to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. It's, it's quite striking. And then the valley opens wide into a place that's more like a series of lakes where there's lots of wildlife, fowls, ducks, and geese. The geese might be yelling at you, honking in your presence, that kind of thing. And then, right at about two miles, two and a half miles actually. You want to look for an old fireplace sitting in the bushes next to the creek. This is the remnants of the Jack Rabbit Lodge, which was a luxury hunting lodge that was built when this was all um, called, um, it. it was a cattle company, Crescent Cattle Company land. Um, prior to, we can thank the Nature Conservancy for buying up this cattle, former ranch land and transferring it to the state as a state wildlife area. But back in the day, um, the Crescent Cattle Company would have their annual stockholder meetings at this hunting lodge, even though their headquarters was in the town of Divide. And it's also rumored that Teddy Roosevelt slept in this cabin on one of his forays into the Pikes Peak area. Well, from here, this is where the trail forks. You can continue walking if you want to go see Dome Rock face to face. Problem is, you can't do that from December 1st to July 31st, I believe, because that's when the bighorn sheep migrate down from Pikes Peak come to Dome Rock to breed, you know, to have their newborns. And that's basically what this place is about, is for them. Um, also, if you do want to walk, and I did later on in the year, they make you they make you wade across Four Mile Creek five times. It's not like it's not like ankle deep wading, it's like thigh deep wading. You take your boots up five times. Sometimes they've been you know a few minutes of each other. It's like they don't want you to go to Dome Rock. So what you can do is you can branch right here and head up the hillside. It's a very beautiful walk through former ranch land. Beautiful fields, aspen, pines. There's some uh, remnants of cabins. There's some remnants of ponds uh, where trout are kind of swimming lazily in the ponds. And then you get up onto the lit bridge and you start getting the views. The first view is Pikes Peak. It doesn't really look like Pikes Peak. It looks like Pikes Ridge because you're viewing it from the south, which is not the way we normally view it from. And you continue on the ridge, up and down, and you get views west of the Sawatch Range and the Sangre de Cristos. And all the time, like, where's Dome Rock? Where's Dome Rock? Every time you come over a rise, he's like, where is it? Where is it? And then suddenly it just pops out and surprises <laughs> like, Oh, that's Dome Rock. Unmistakable. It just pops out, almost makes you want to laugh. And um, Dome Rock, now this is a classic example of what I was talking about with exfoliation, where it was granite that got compressed and the avalanche cracked and fell away. So if you want to walk the whole five and a half miles, actually you can start seeing Dome Rock at five miles. So ten miles round trip to get a glimpse of Dome Rock. Um, it's, worth, it's worth it because it's a nice place to sit and look at this 
odd rock formation. And again, in the spring, very beautiful with the Sangre de Cristos still covered in snow in the distance. So a little bit more on dome rock. Like I said earlier, I like, I love to get to the top of things. And when I saw it from this view, I like, I need to go look at it closer. So I went back after Bighorn season. I think I went back in September, and I walked, I waited the stream five times, and I got face to face with it. And it's really, really pretty. Really, really. If you want to wait the stream five times, you can walk the other side. It's a loop trip, so you can walk the other way. It's quite a long walk without waiting the stream to to get there. Um, the other thing I thought was when I was there, like, I like to get to the top of things. And I thought, when I was looking at it from this view, I thought if I could just get to that saddle, it looked like there was a way to go, right? Mm -hmm. So I got here, and I thought I kept thinking about that former view, and I'm like, I'm gonna go for it, even though. I, might have been against the rules because they say no rock climbing at the trailhead. And I, I wasn't rock climbing, I was walking up the rock. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of holding onto this crack as I went. And it, it was it was easy, but it was interesting. It was like climbing a miniature half dome or something. That's the view I got from the side. It's a little bit dizzying. And there's the proof that I made it to the top. It's very kind of spiritual, energetic feeling standing on the top of the dome. Very, very fun, very interesting. All right. Um, I'm going to start wrapping this up now. Those are the hikes that I think are wonderful for spring. I think a um, good idea to get out there and enjoy them while, while the higher country is still opening up. Yes? Could you mention that the library has backpacks with state park passes in it that you can check out I didn't know that. and get into the state parks for free? I didn't know we that. We have four. Yes. Let's say that louder. The um, library has backpacks that you can check out that have state park passes that will allow you to enjoy a state park for free. State park, not national park. Not national park. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Rocky is yes. more expensive. So then I think it's seven dollars um, for a state park if you don't have the pass. So it's a nice way to save seven bucks. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, I just want to say, like I said earlier, we live in an amazing base camp. Um, sometimes my favorite part of the hike, especially if we're doing 11 miles to Dome Rock, um, is getting back to the car, exhausted, exhilarated, prying those beats, boots off your feet, and just going to heaven. You know? And then you get to take the experience of the wonderful day back with you to civilization. And heck, Denver is a great base camp, but Longmont is a great base camp. I mean, replete with um, restaurants, coffee houses, theaters, movie houses, as well as great um, stage theaters, um, breweries, brew houses. Um, you can get here, you can get some great food and drink. You can socialize with other people who like to be outdoors and share stories with them. You can get some rest in a bed. A real bed, and then get ready to hike again. So, um, I like to think that uh, the book, the hiking book of the hikes that I wrote, can help you um, enjoy being outdoors. I also would like to mention that if you do like the book, um, um, I donate all my royalties. You're helping by purchasing the book because I donate my royalties to the Nature Conservancy because I think that they do amazing work here in Colorado, not to mention all over the world. They do a lot of great work, especially in developing countries where it's so important to be working on conservation because of the pressure between industry and conserving you know, wilderness is so great. So again, thank you very much for coming. Hope you enjoy yourself. And especially enjoy your time outside. And yes, let's take some questions. Yeah, can I just do a quick um, advertisement for if, for those, those of you who are seniors? If you're not aware, the senior center has a hiking group. We hike every Thursday. Um, this Thursday we're doing Potasso. Uh, Potasso. We're doing, yeah, we're doing that Rattlesnake Trail. We're doing the Black Canyon Trail. Um, we're doing Serenade St. Brain this year. So we hike every Thursday. And if you check out the senior center catalog to go. It lists all the, uh, the, uh, the trails that we're doing. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. I'm one of the hiking leaders. Thank you. Thank you.